Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Hamilton, and I'm the president of New York University, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this special event this afternoon, and especially to welcome Secretary General Guterres for coming to NYU today. We are honored to host him and very pleased and intrigued to hear his important perspectives on one of the most pressing issues of our time. NYU is a very fitting place for a discussion on climate change. This is an, a global issue of immense importance, and it's one that everyone in this room and far beyond this room recognizes is most effectively addressed from a variety of angles, from science and engineering to business and law to public policy and public health. And NYU's faculty and students are tackling it in precisely this global and interdisciplinary way. And let me just touch upon a couple of examples from NYU to make this point. The Stern School of Business, the very school that we are in this afternoon, its Center for Sustainable Business, and I'm delighted that the director of the Center for Sustainable Business, Professor Tensi Whelan, will be moderating today's question and answer. But that center very much partners with the private sector to improve sustainable practices in a range of different industries. NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study regularly hosts academic symposia and conferences on sustainability, including most recently an international gathering in Paris this past March. The Center for Atmospheric Ocean Science, based at NYU's Courant Institute of Mathematical Studies, is another focal point where the gap is being bridged between applied mathematics and our understanding of the complex, the enormously complex climate system. Our Department of Environmental Studies at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences looks at climate change through a profoundly complementary interdisciplinary lens. At our global sites, at NYU Abu Dhabi, for example, the Center for Global Sea Change combines on-the-ground observations with computer modeling to study sea level rise in Greenland and elsewhere. And NYU School of Law, just down the road, is the leading institution in environmental law among the top American law schools. Our Center for Global Affairs at the School of Professional Studies is also analyzing many aspects of energy and climate change as it influences national and global policy. We don't just study climate change. I'm very pleased to say that we go beyond talking the talk. We also focus on what we can do. And in a university-wide effort led by our sustainability task force, NYU succeeded in reducing our own carbon emissions by 30% between 2006 and 2012. And we have accepted the mayor of New York's newest carbon challenge to achieve a 50% reduction uh, in emissions by 2025. So climate change is an issue with which we as a university are very much engaged in the university across the city of New York and across the world. And I'm delighted to now bring to the podium someone who also, through his period as dean of the Stern School of Business, has also led major uh, commitments and initiatives in climate change. Stern's dean, Peter Henry, brings an international perspective to this leadership as well. He's an expert on the global economy. Dean Henry has testified before the United States uh, uh, Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and before a number of ambassadors to the United Nations. And during his tenure as dean, uh, Stern established the Center for Sustainable Business, as well as st centers studying business and human rights and how best to harness the growth of global cities 
to speed up global progress. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dean Peter Henry to the podium, and he will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Welcome again to New York University and the Stern School of Business. I can't think of a better place or a better audience of students, faculty, and those interested in climate action and sustainable business to host the Secretary General for his first public speech on climate action. Here at Stern, we believe that business can be a force for good in the world, that in the quest to create value, not only for shareholders, but for all stakeholders, the impact on both business and society truly matters. Through the work, as Andy mentioned, of our Center for Business and Human Rights, the first of its kind at any business school, and our Center for Sustainable Business, we are putting this belief into action. Profit and principle can and indeed must coexist. We have direct evidence that this is the case. In convening this discussion today, let us also be reminded about how each of us as global citizens and businessmen and women can positively influence the green economy and embrace sustainability. Before I introduce the Secretary General, allow me to explain briefly the format of this event. The Secretary General will speak for about 25 minutes and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. So as the Secretary, Secretary General speaks, please be thinking about your questions. And now, as President Hamilton mentioned, Antonio Guterres is the ninth Secretary General of the United Nations, having taken office on January 1st, 2017. Having witnessed the suffering of the most vulnerable people on earth, in refugee camps and in war zones, the Secretary General is determined to make human dignity the core of his work and to serve as a peace broker, a bridge builder, and a promoter of reform and innovation. Prior to his appointment as Secretary General, he served as United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees from June 2005 to December 2015, heading one of the world's foremost humanitarian organizations during some of the most serious displacement crises in decades. Before that, the Secretary General spent more than 20 years in government and public service. He served as Prime Minister of Portugal from 1995 to 2002. As President of the European Council in early 2000, he led the adoption of the Lisbon Agenda for Growth and Jobs and co-chaired the first European Union Africa Summit. He was a member of the Portuguese Council of State from 1991 to 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome United Nations Secretary Antonio Guterres. President Hamilton, Dean Henry, Professor Willen, dear friends, I would like to thank everyone at New York University and especially the Stern School of Business for your warm welcome and your role in making today's gathering possible. Let me also thank all of you for being here to discuss the crucial challenge of climate change and how we must address it. I can think of no better audience. This wonderful mix of scholars and scientists, students and activists, investors and entrepreneurs, the people who together are making climate action real. And I can think of no better place to have this conversation than here at New York University and the Stern School, where you are dedicated to cultivating solutions and a new generation of leaders. This notion of intergenerational responsibility is very much on my mind. My grandfather was born in 1875. He could not have imagined the world we live in today. Now I have three granddaughters of my own. The oldest is eight. I cannot imagine the world they will inhabit decades from now when they will be my age. But not knowing is no excuse for not acting to ensure that we do not undermine their future. I want my grandchildren to inherit a healthy world free of conflict and suffering and a healthy planet 
rooted in low-carbon, sustainable solutions. This is my wish for everyone, everywhere. And to get there, we have our work cut out for us. Allow me to be blunt. The world is in a mess. Countries and communities everywhere are facing pressures that are being exacerbated by megatrends like population growth, rapid and many times chaotic urbanization, food insecurity, water scarcity, massive movements of population, and the list can go on and on. But one overriding megatrend is far and away at the top of that list, climate change. Climate change is a direct threat in itself, but a multiplier of many other threats from poverty to displacement to conflict. And the effects of climate change are already being felt around the world, and they are dangerous, and they are accelerating. And so my argument today is that it is absolutely essential that the world implements the Paris Agreement and that we fulfill that duty with increased ambition. And the reason is threefold. Climate change is undeniable. Climate action is unstoppable. And climate solutions provide opportunities that are unmatchable. Let us start with the reality of climate change today. The science is beyond doubt. The world's top scientists have been shouting it from the rooftops. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has put it, and I quote, human influence on the climate system is clear. The more we disrupt our climate, the more we risk severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts. Dear friends, if anything, that disruption is happening even faster than expected. Last year was once again the hottest on record. The past decade has also been the hottest on record. Every geophysical system on which we depend is being affected, from mountains to oceans, from ice caps to forests, and across all the arable lands that provide our food. Sea ice is at a historic low. Sea levels are at a historic high, threatening the existence of low-lying island nations and cities. And the seas are also being affected by warmer temperatures, rapid acidification, and coral bleaching, endangering the marine food chain on which so many livelihoods and economies depend. On land, glaciers are retreating almost everywhere, a risk to the breadbasket of the world as rivers fed by glaciers run dry. Soon, the famous snows of Kilimanjaro will exist only in stories. Here in the United States, only 26 of Glacier National Park's glaciers remain. When it was made a park in 1910, there were around 150. I hope you will never have to rename it the No Glacier National Park. For the North, we see an unfolding crisis of epic proportions. The ice caps in the Arctic Ocean are shrinking dramatically. Some even predict that the Arctic Ocean could be ice-free by the summer of 2020. That would be catastrophic for Arctic wildlife. It would be a death blow to the ways of life of indigenous peoples, and it would be a disaster for the world. Why? Because ice reflects sunlight, dark water, much less. That means warming will accelerate. Frozen tundra will thaw earlier and freeze later, releasing vast amounts of methane into the atmosphere. Methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. This will mean more ice melting from the Greenland ice cap. It could alter the Gulf Stream and affect food production, water scarcity, and weather patterns from Canada to India. We are already seeing massive floods, more extreme tornadoes, failed monsoons, and fiercer hurricanes and typhoons. But slow motion disasters are also speeding up. Areas where drought once struck every decade are now seeing cycles of five or even two years between droughts. And moreover, dry spells are lasting longer 
from California to the Sahel. Dear friends, the moral imperative for action is clear. The people eat first and worst by climate change are the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. Women and girls will suffer as they are always the most disproportionately affected by disasters. And the nations that will face the most profound consequences are the least responsible for climate change and the least equipped to deal with it. Droughts and floods around the world mean poverty will worsen, famines will spread, and people will die. As regions become unlivable, more and more people will be forced to move from degraded lands to cities and to other nations. We see this already across North Africa and the Middle East. And that is why there is also a compelling security case for climate action. Around the world, military strategists view climate change as a threat to global peace and security. We are all aware of the political turmoil and so societal tensions that have been generated by the mass movement of refugees. Imagine how many people are poised to become climate displaced when their lands become unlivable. Last year, more than 24 million people in 118 countries and territories were displaced by natural disasters. That is three times as many as were displaced by conflict. Climate change is also a menace to jobs, to property, and to business. With wildfires, floods, and other extreme weather events becoming more common, the economy costs are soaring. The insurance industry raised the alarm long ago. They have been joined by many others across the business community. And they know that the time has come for transformation. Dear friends, Climate action is gathering momentum, not just because it is a necessity, but also because it presents an opportunity to forge a peaceful and sustainable future on a healthy planet. And this is why governments adopted the Paris Agreement in 2015 with a pledge to limit global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. And I applaud the immense efforts of my predecessor, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who brought the essential stakeholders to the table and helped forge this landmark agreement. It is worth taking a moment to step back and reflect on the unity that was forged in Paris. It was a remarkable moment in the history of humankind. The world came together for the first time to address this global challenge collectively. And it did so at a time of division in so many other areas. There has been nothing like it in terms of enabling the global community to work on an issue together that none of us can solve on our own. And today it's increasingly understood that implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development goes hand in hand with limiting global temperature rise and increasing climate resilience. As of today, 147 parties representing more than 82% of greenhouse gas emissions have ratified the Paris Agreement. Every month, more countries are translating their Paris pledges into national climate action plans. Yet, not everyone will move at the same pace or with equal vigor. But if any government doubts the global will and need for this accord, that is reason for all others to unite even stronger and stay the course. It is reason to build ever broader coalitions with civil society and business, with citizen states, with academia and community leaders. Indeed, all around the world, cities, regions, states and territories are setting their own ambitious targets. Thousands of private corporations, including major oil and gas companies, are taking their own action. And they know that green business is good business. It is not just the right thing to do. It is the smart thing to do. Some may seek to portray the response to climate change as a fundamental threat to the economy. Yet, what we are witnessing in these early years of a systemic response is the opposite. 
We are seeing new industries, new markets, healthier environments, more jobs, less dependency on global supply chains of fossil fuels. The real danger is not the threat to one's economy that comes from acting. It is instead the risk to one's economy by failing to act. And the message is simple. The sustainability train has left the station. Get on board or get left behind. Those who fail to bet on the green economy will be living in a grey future. On the other hand, those who embrace green technologies will set the gold standard for economic leadership in the 21st century. Last year, solar power grew 50% with China and the United States in the lead. Around the world, over half of the new power generation capacity now comes from renewables. In Europe, the figure is more than 90%. The falling cost of renewables is one of the most encouraging stories on the planet today. In the United States and China, new renewable energy jobs now outstrip those created in the oil and gas industries. And China aims to increase its renewable energy by about 40% by 2020. Major oil producers are also seeing the future and diversifying their economies. Even Saudi Arabia announced plans to install 700 megawatts of solar and wind power. And industry experts predict India's solar capacity will double this year to 18 gigawatts. Boasting energy efficiency is also crucial for reducing climate risk and for increasing profits. The International Energy Agency has indicated that investing in energy efficiency could increase global economic output by 18 trillion US dollars, more than the outputs of the United States, Canada and Mexico combined. And future spending on energy infrastructure alone could total some 37 trillion US dollars. Now, if that is the case, it is crucial for such massive investment to be sustainable and climate friendly. Otherwise, we will lock ourselves into bad practices for decades to come. Given the facts about youth unemployment, air pollution and climate change, surely it is common sense to put our investments where they will generate the most savings, create the most jobs, deliver the biggest health dividends and have the most impact against the global warming. Surely that is why nearly two dozen of the world's most successful business leaders, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists plan to invest in a fund called Breakthrough Energy Ventures led by Bill Gates to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with clean energy technology. And it is why green bonds are starting to come in many different shades, as the size of the market for securities designed to benefit the environment is on track to double again, from 93 billion US dollars in 2016 to 206 this year. And it is why 60% of the world's 500 largest asset owners are taking steps to recognize the financial risk associated with climate change. And it is why more than 7,000 cities in the newly launched Global Covenant of Mayors have agreed to report their emissions and climate progress according to a standard set of tools that are more rigorous than those currently used by many countries. And here I want to salute my special envoy for cities and climate change, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He's showing great leadership in mobilizing mayors and cities to build the resilient and dynamic cities of the future. Dear friends, science is speaking to us very clearly about what's happening. Innovation is showing us very clearly what can be done. If we want to protect forests and life on land, safeguard our oceans, create massive economic opportunities, prevent even more massive losses, and improve the health and well-being of people and the planet, we have one simple option staring us in the face, climate action. Today, I call on all leaders of government, business and civil society to back the most ambitious action on climate change for the benefit of this generation and generations to come. And the Secretary General, I am committed to mobilize the world to meet this challenge. And I will do so in at least five concrete ways. First, I will intensify high-level political engagement to raise the bar on climate action. 
The Paris pledges are historic, but still do not go nearly far enough to limit temperature rise to well below 2 degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. Commitments so far could still see temperatures rise by 3 degrees or more. So we must do our utmost to increase ambition and action until we can bend the emissions curve and slow down global warming. Most immediately, I will also press for ratification of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Depleased the Ozone Layer. And next week's Ocean Conference at United Nations Headquarters is yet another opportunity to build momentum. Second, I will rally the full capacity of the United Nations Development System behind climate action and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, especially at the country level because that is where true change will be achieved. As we support member states, I will continue to emphasize the urgency of empowering world's women and girls. There can be no successful response to a change in climate with also changing mindsets about the key role of women in tackling climate change and building the future we want. Third, I will use the convening power of the United Nations to work with governments and all major actors, such as the coal, oil and gas industries, to accelerate the necessary energy transition. 80% of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels, oil, gas and coal. We cannot phase out fossil fuels overnight. We have to engage the energy industry and governments to use fossil fuels as cleanly, sparingly, and responsibly as possible while transforming our energy systems. And I will work with all actors to promote a global energy transition, the greening of investments in infrastructure and transport, and progress on carbon pricing. More and more politicians, policymakers, and business actors are calling for a carbon price as the green economy's missing link. Putting a price on carbon at a global scale could unleash innovation and provide the incentives that the industries and consumers need to make sustainable choices. Fourth, I will work with countries to mobilize national and international resources to support mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and implementation of the national climate action plans. And I will focus on strengthening resilience of the small island states against the existential threat that climate change poses to them. I will encourage developed countries to fulfill the pledges they have made to support developing countries, including for the Green Climate Fund. And as a matter of global solidarity, the international community must also help developing countries increase their capacity to generate their own resources and to gain access to capital markets. The international financial institutions have a key role to play to help deliver innovative financing that matches the enormous needs. And fifth, I will encourage new and strengthened partnerships for implementing the Paris Agreement through North-South, South-South, and triangular cooperation. We need to harness the enormous potential of these partnerships. In all these areas, I will use every possible opportunity to persuade prod and push for progress. And I will count on the vital forces of civil society to do the same. Looking further ahead, I also intend to convene a dedicated climate summit in 2019 to make sure we reach the critical first review of Paris implementation with a strong wind of a green economy at our backs. Let me also stress that my door is open to all who wish to discuss the way forward, even those who might hold divergent perspectives. The climate conversation should cease to be a shouting match. Yet there will continue to be strong differences about how to achieve our climate goals. Yet it is also clear that the journey from Paris is well underway and the support across all sectors of society is profound. The transition in the real economy is a fact. There will be bumps along the path. That is understandable in a family of over 190 nations. But with everyone's participation, the world can bring the Paris Agreement fully to life. And I look forward to continuing to engage all countries in forging a truly shared vision of the way ahead that leaves no one behind. 
Dear friends, let me conclude where I began. With all of you and with the power of people to make a difference. Climate change is an unprecedented and growing threat. The arguments for action are clear. So are the immense opportunities for peace and prosperity if we act quickly and decisively. All of us, governments, businesses, consumers, will have to make changes. More than that, we will have to be the change. This may not be easy at times, but for the sake of today's and future generations, it's the path we must pursue. And this is my message to all the world's leaders. Students, scientists, and others such as you across the world help to put the climate challenge on the table. If we work together as a global community, we can emerge stronger, safer, and more prosperous for our shared future and the future of all our grandchildren, like my three granddaughters. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, Secretary General, for that visionary, tangible, and inclusive call to action. I would now like to introduce NYU Stern Professor Tansi Whelan, who will be moderating the question and answer session. Professor Whelan is a professor in the Stern Business and Society Program and director of the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business. She joined Stern in November of 2015 from the Rainforest Alliance, where she served as president. Tansi leads the school's efforts on issues of business and sustainability, driving research and coursework on natural resource-based challenges, including climate change, water scarcity, biodiversity loss, poverty, and unsustainable development. As Professor Whelan comes up, please note we have volunteers in the aisles with microphones to take questions. Tansi, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary General, for an incredibly inspiring and motivating call to action, really. That was a call to action, not a speech. It was something that really gave us a lot to think about. And um, <clears throat> I, I am lucky enough to be able to kick this off with two questions to you. Now, as a professor, I'd like to start lecturing and ask a lot of questions, but I'm not allowed. We really want to make this um, inclusive and have a great diversity of, of questions from the audience. Um, so to start with, I, I'd just like to ask you the the Paris Accord represents um, a truly momentous agreement by uh, state leaders across the globe and the business community. Um, but given that, for example, in this country, the business community controls 18 trillion of our GDP, and government and uh, civil society about 3 trillion, the role of business clearly is, is extremely important. And I'm hoping you can give us, in addition to some of the the broad themes you laid out, some very specific suggestions and ideas for the business community in terms of the role and leadership that they can take. And also, as you mentioned, what are not only the negative things that they can address, but what are the business opportunities for, for uh, the business community in, in the challenges related to climate change? I think that um, most of the business leaders have a vision about the future. Nope. Uh, at a certain moment, um, uh, when people would have to decide whether to invest in the digital economy or in the old economy, probably many would hesitate. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that those that have a bet on the digital had a bet on the digital economy were the ones that were more successful as business leaders. And I think the problem is exactly the same today with the green economy. Probably in some areas here or there. Um, uh, there might be still some doubts whether or not a green investment strategy is the most profitable. But I have no doubt that in the long run, it is obvious it is the case. And uh, as I said, um, many of those that have large assets to manage are understanding that there is a risk uh, in putting those assets in things that are, uh, I would say, um, uh, climate change sensitive. Uh, which means that... Uh, for those business leaders that want to bet in, the, in a position in the future in which they will have a dominant position in the markets, mm -hmm. as for countries that want their economies to be leading economies in the future, 
to bet in the green economy is the right choice. Even if in some years, depending on what we are talking about, it might be still questionable whether that is or not the most immediately profitable um, uh, uh, action. And that is where the action of governments is also important, creating the right incentives. Uh, I remember in my own country when I was in government, one of the things we did was um, to uh, create a system of incentives uh, for the national electric grid to buy um, energy from renewable uh, energy sources uh, of different kinds. At the time, this represented for the government a certain investment. Um, the truth is that today, uh, Portugal has many days in which all the energy is produced is renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And it's a success story everywhere. And no more subsidies are needed at, in, at all. And uh, um, that became the most profitable way of doing business. Again, if governments have the capacity to create some incentives in some periods to allow the business community to overcome some initial difficulties, then you have the perfect combination. But even if governments are reluctant to play their role, and uh, this is probably the case in um, some parts of the world that I will not describe, um, <laughs> even if governments are reliable, I think it's the right thing to do for the business community, especially in energies as sensitive as uh, uh, in areas as sensitive as energy or transportation, I think it's the right thing to do to bet uh, in a green economy because at long term, I have no doubt it will be the most profitable one. So in other words, we're really seeing sustainability and profitability go hand in hand and that, that, that those investments with the support of government really make a lot of sense. Great. And so, uh, yes. if I may say something, if you go to a country like China, mm -hmm. China, for different reasons, is probably today the only big country in the world that has a clear long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. And China was, a few years ago, clearly betting in the gray economy. All of a sudden, there was a total shift. And China now is betting in the green economy. Okay. Because they have seen where the world is going. And they want to be a dominant economy in 10 or 20 years' time. Those that will not, be the, will not do the same will be the economies lagging behind in 10 or 20 years' time. Be at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. Let me ask one more question, and, and this is more from the student perspective. For some students I speak with, they feel depressed and challenged with the scope and size of climate change and, the, and, and really um, fail to see what kind of role they can play as individuals in tackling this challenge, and particularly when we see the array of political and business forces at times against uh, doing, taking action around climate change. What advice would you give to students about what they can do personally and in their professional life to, to begin to be part of this solution? Well, students can engage with the civil society organizations, mm -hmm. namely those that have climate action in the center of their concerns. Students can think about their own way to uh, act as consumers. Mm -hmm. No, there are choices we can make on what we use, what we eat, what I mean, the way we, we, we act. Uh, um, and um, I think that students can have uh, an influence uh, with their communities, uh, they engage with their communities um, in line with the green economy. They can, uh, most of the students are adult students. They have a role in the political life of their country. So there's many things students can do in all aspects, from their behavior to their engagement with the civil society to their engagement as citizens. Good, so let's um, thank you. Let's turn it over to the students. So what I'm gonna do now is um, ask for a couple of questions. We'll, we'll hold after those couple of questions and then the Secretary General will ask, answer a few of them. We're gonna start with students and then move to civil society and business. And can I ask two things? Please confine your questions to climate change and also if you can, uh, <laughs> though I'm sure there'll be other fun things to ask the Secretary General about. And also, please state your name. So if we could see hands for students. OK, we have one here, one here, and one in the back. And um, so one here, one right here, and uh, one in the back there. Students, please. So if, uh, we'll, if you can ask for three questions, and then we'll um, have the Secretary General respond. Sure. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, I just want to thank you, uh, just Secretary a, General. We have a, a sheet of paper just to take notes, just in case. I, no, a paper, just to make sure that I don't forget any of the questions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you for your time, Secretary General. Um, my question is this. Uh, in the ideal scenario where we have transitioned almost completely to renewables, the oil and gas giants will undoubtedly suffer losses, at least in part, due to the level of physical capital investment into pumping and pipeline infrastructures. You spoke about partnering between governments and corporations, but I struggle to see how the relationships, specifically with oil and gas, will not at least in part be adversarial or zero sum. In a world of renewables dominance, what place is there for oil and gas? And what incentive is there for them uh, to completely alter and perhaps displace their core line of business? Thank you. And if we can take the next question. Hi. Uh, hello. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Papa Yao. Um, you mentioned earlier the mobilization of financial institutions to aid developing nations uh, to work to like work to remedy climate change. And my question is, uh, for a developing economy like, say, the government of Ghana, which loses about 30% of their profit to debt um, every single year, the governmental revenue to debt, how do you see like convincing them to possibly move into expensive like climate change programs from financial institutions, which will prove expensive over the next five to 10 years, and then therefore increase the amount they, um, their governmental revenue goes into like debt overall? Thank you. And then I think we had our third question over there. Uh, hi, my question is, how are you going to deal with a uh, administration that's uh, environmentally uh, a skeptic and who is about to uh, walk away from the um, Paris Agreement and who wants to cut budget for the UN? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> a nice, nice range of questions. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think there is a difference between oil and gas, um, and um, it's important to make that distinction. Uh, uh, gas, uh, um, uh, is, as you know, uh, has a, a, a less carbon imprint than oil. Um, and first, most of the uh, visionary leaders in this sector are betting on renewable energies, and are betting on the cleanest possible way to also do their business. So um, it's not by chance that a lot of the investments are being made in renewable energies are made by these companies. And it's not the, same, the first time that this happens. If you look at, uh, for instance, a company like IBM today, is totally different from what IBM was uh, uh, when mainframe computers were dominant in the computer industry. So uh, these companies have the resources and the capacity to invest and to um, uh, adapt themselves to a changing environment. Even is, uh, as I said, um, the, the, the two sectors are probably different. And I see gas with a, a larger future than, uh, than, uh, than oil. Um, but uh, uh, one thing that it is also clear for me um, it is that uh, if one looks at today's oil reserves, very probably, uh, and this is uh, what I'm going to say has nothing to do with the UN nation, United Nations uh, position, if things move as quickly as I would like them to move, probably we would not be using all the oil reserves that exist in today's world. But that uh, is probably to be too optimistic. Um, uh, uh, what it, it is clear is that uh, I believe uh, many, of those, uh, many of those companies are already uh, uh, doing what is necessary to adapt. Others will probably resist uh, uh, more. But this is not tomorrow. We will not be able to live without, uh, obviously, um, uh, uh, completely without oil and gas. So there is a, a transition. That transition will take time, and we will give plenty of time for these companies to adapt them. Uh, now, Ghana and the uh, first. Um, there is development aid, and there is development aid that was defined with this objective, and Ghana should be entitled to be able to have access to that development aid, the um, 100 billion per, uh, per year that um, are supposed to exist in a few years' time. It's not yet entirely clear. Second. Um, Ghana has its own tax system. And there are choices about what tax systems uh, should be. No? Uh, and uh, um, uh, a lot of countries are spending huge amount of money in subsidizing fuel, fossil fuels, instead of taxing them. 
and for instance, uh, having a much friendly tax system to labor. So th th there are choices that countries can make that will, uh, of course, make their own options different. Second, um, uh, it, it would be very important for international financial institutions to create uh, mechanisms that allow to leverage resources to support developing countries uh, in this regard. For instance, um, uh, now I give an example that has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the, the green economy, but had to do with my previous activity. Uh, I was very worried when I was High Commissioner for Refugees that countries like Lebanon and Jordan had no access to concessional fund fi financing from the World Bank because they were middle income countries. And finally, it was possible to convince uh, um, the board of the World Bank and uh, together with some donors. So with a small grant, you can transform a market loan into a concessional loan with a larger period and no interest rates, uh, which means that there are ways in which you can leverage resources to increase the amounts of innovative funding that are available for countries. Then countries need, this needs to be done with access to capital markets and with access to private investment. And again, this is, there is no way this can be done only with public money. Private investment will be absolutely crucial. So how to help governments create the conditions to attract private investment in these areas of the economy? And there are a number of mechanisms that can allow to uh, uh, help countries like Ghana have access to capital markets, guarantees uh, and the different other mechanisms. So there is a number of uh, uh, ways in which you can, with innovative financing, create mechanisms that make it attractive for countries like Ghana to invest in those areas, multiplying with a multiplication effect of the amounts that are available in development aid. Now, you know, <laughs> it's very simple. When you disagree with someone, you try to convince that person, no? It's the same with administrations. So we are engaging with the American administration on we believe that uh, it would be important for the US uh, uh, not to leave the Paris Agreement. But even if the US government decides to leave the Paris Agreement, it's very important for the US societies as a whole, for the cities, the states, the companies, the business, to remain engaged with the, the Paris Agreement. So uh, um, it, it is very clear that governments are not everything. And on the other hand, uh, we are uh, doing our best in dialogue with the administration and Congress uh, to make the US understand that uh, funding development aid, funding uh, foreign policy in general, funding organizations like the UN is also in the interest of the American people. Uh, if one looks at today's world, um, uh, I, I believe you have uh, in this room students of uh, physics. There was a big mistake in physics for centuries that uh, there was the thinking that uh, nature had order to uh, the vacuum, to void. It's not true. It's proven now that vacuum can exist in physics, but vacuum cannot exist in geostrategic dimensions, which means if one country decides not to be present, and I'm talking about countries with uh, an important global reach, like it is the case of the United States or China, uh, if one country uh, decides to leave avoid, I can guarantee someone else will occupy it. And it's very clear now when one looks at today's world how this has happened. And it's not only the Russias and the Chinas that are occupying the ground. If you look at the, the Saudi Arabias, the Turkeys, the Irans, the regional powers in many parts of the world, when the big powers leave some space, they will occupy it. Which means uh, that sometimes this then has consequences, and especially when everything is linked. Today, the economy and the social aspects are linked to the environmental aspects, but they're also linked to the security aspects. They are linked to the risks of conflict. And the conflicts are becoming more and more interlinked and linked to the new threat of global terrorism. You have seen what has happened in Manchester just a few days ago. Uh, so, I mean, if you leave a void to others to occupy, you might be creating a problem to your own internal security. So there are many good arguments that, in my opinion, should lead an administration that has a concern to put its own interests first and the interests of its people and its country first to invest in what is necessary to preserve uh, the global reach of its economy and to preserve the security of its citizens. Thank you.
let's now take a few questions from civil society and faculty. So if we can have hands, do you fit in that category? Yes? OK, great. We have one there. Do we have anybody else from that? And one down here? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary General. What an honor to, to hear you speak. Um, my name is Jessica Green. I'm a professor of environmental studies and political science. Um, I was especially intrigued to hear what you had to say about carbon pricing, uh, given that the UN high-level panel just came out with a report today calling for $100 a ton tax or price on carbon. Um, so I'm wondering, how do we get to that, particularly if, as you mentioned, so many governments continue to subsidize fossil fuels to the tune of, of trillions of dollars a year? Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we have one down here. Hello. My name is Jenny Young. Uh, here. <laughs> um, I have an NGO called United Nations Education, Science, Cultural Health Advancement Foundation, um, and I am also uh, representing uh, a couple of China uh, consortium that we are into the Silk Road universities. We are into also the Silk Road investment funds um, that will be all coming through that cover also oil and gas satellites. So my mission is to help revive global economies. Um, it will be very beneficial for us to understand specifically what are the business scope that related for China and the world that we want to highlight development for specifically the topic of climate action. Thank you. Go ahead. Well. There are many ways to do carbon pricing. I mean, uh, you can cap and trade, you can put a tax. I mean, there, there are many ways. Uh, uh, and of course, it's not for me to give advice on what is the best possible way to, to do it. Uh, my feeling is that to, to make carbon have a price is fair. Because if carbon has the impacts that we have been discussing in today's session, each there is an impact in the economy that should be reflected in a price. Um, so it's, it's the right thing to do. Now, on the other hand, if one looks, uh, for instance, at tax systems, in a world where we have so, so large levels of unemployment, um, I have no doubt that, uh, um, and when, for instance, youth unemployment in some parts of the world became also a global risk for security. Um, uh, when uh, there was a survey recently done for the young people that were coming back from these scenarios, I mean, uh, the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Afghanistan, that came back to their countries after fighting there. And uh, the survey demonstrated that the main reason why they had gone, there are many ideological, really, whatever, the main reason was lack of opportunities. And if you look at a country like Tunisia, it's a good example like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic democracy. It was the success story of the Arab Spring. But there is a very high number of Tunisians fighting in the Daesh and Al-Qaeda and whatever. Why? Because there is a huge youth unemployment in Tunisia. So in a context in which unemployment became a very serious problem, I think it makes sense to reduce the tax on labor and to increase the tax on carbon. And so you can do it in a way that is, I would say, um, neutral from the point of view of, uh, of, of your economy. But of course, you are facilitating that more people can work and making difficult that um, more climate change is, uh, uh, is induced. So um, uh, I mean, there are many reasons that justify it. The problem is that many of our societies have an addicted an addiction to uh, cheap energy. And uh, uh, it is true that in many countries, in electoral campaigns, and people uh, do polls and whatever, and they are afraid to raise, uh, to reduce subsidies to, um, uh, to fuel and things of the sort because of the elections and whatever. That is why we, we need political leadership. Political leaders, uh, uh, if they only look at the polls and they only try to think about the next election and to win the next election, there is one thing I can guarantee. Sooner or later, they will lose an election. And when they lose an election, they will have no legacy 
behind them. If they are ready to lose an election to make their idealism prevail in a, in, a, uh, in a society, they sooner or later will be understood. Maybe they will lose that election. Uh, and by the way, my experience in European politics, I don't know how it is in the, in, in, in the US, is that sometimes people trying to imitate others and changing their policies to imitate others to try to win votes, they end up losing votes. Um, uh, if they are authentic and if they, if they are able to express their ideals and they lead, um, uh, we some, they might have the surprise to win the election and not lose them. And even if to lose an election is anything that can happen to a politician, uh, it is better to lose an election than to lose our principles, our ideals, and our vision of what the world should be. Because, as I said, sooner or later, people will tend to lose an election. So it's better, at least, to leave a consistent legacy. Thank you. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that I'm not convinced that to, be, uh, to, to do the right thing in the end pays. I think usually to do the right thing pays because people also look at the sincerity and people look at the honesty of those that are confronting them. Did you have any comments on the other? No. I, I, I don't know if I understood well, but um, uh, 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 I think it is very clear that China made a very strong bet recently in greening its economy. China has terrible problems of pollution, as it is known. Uh, China uh, had uh, relied uh, in a very high energy uh, growth based on carbon for a long period. Now it's, all this is being reversed. Um, uh, I had the, the chance to be in China just uh, one week ago, and I was told that the, carbon, the, the coal areas are now highly depressed because there was a massive shift uh, into other forms of energy. Uh, uh, so China made a clear option in greening its economy. What I hope is that China, that is having a bigger and bigger role in South-South cooperation, and Chinese companies that are investing more and more in the world, that they are able to translate that internal concern of greening its economy also with a green strategy in their external relations. Because as we know, in some uh, areas in the past, there was a certain trend to export dirt, no? Uh, and I think it's very important that China doesn't do it, that China applies to their international cooperation the same strategy that China is now applying to its own economy. And I am hopeful that that will be the case. And uh, um, this is true for all other economies in the world. But I think it would be very important uh, if you are a Chinese citizen to engage positively uh, in your own country for that to be possible. I think it's important that international cooperation reflects the same options that national policy reflects. So for our last few questions, um, I know we have a number of business leaders in the, in the audience. If we could hear from business people. So uh, yes, in the middle here and then in the middle there. It's right there. And then there was in the middle back gentleman in a blue. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, my name is Mike Eckhart. I'm the head of environmental finance at Citigroup. So this is very much in my wheelhouse. And the question I have is about really, truly engaging the private sector, which I know you believe in, but we haven't found the answers yet. And that's my question. You know, almost a half of all the major private sector organizations have a written sustainability plan, like the NDCs. So one idea I've been discussing among business people is should we put forward the idea to open up the Paris Agreement to let the private sector sign it and put forward their NDCs or some other mechanism to more, more engage and do this right away? What do you think of that? I think it's an excellent idea. <laughs> I think we need to find all kinds of new forms of allowing for the private sector to have a stronger voice in this discussion. We had another comment back there, right, right there in the middle. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Secretary General. Uh, I'm Mr. Sergi, Giuseppe Sergi from the European Union Association. We, I'm a graduate from NYU Stern, so I'm a homecoming here. Uh, we are um, recognized at the UN uh, with special consultative status with ICOSOC 
and we are preparing an event in October uh, using the platform of the Union for the Mediterranean to work on a shift of uh, development economy from carbon-based to um, uh, renewable energy. Do you think a, um, an organization like the Union for the Mediterranean can be useful uh, in trying to first uh, take care of the unemployment and migration problems in North Africa and Europe, also decrease tensions on a social level and, uh, and, and uh, make an example for a shift again from, um, from a carbon-based economy to a renewable economy in a part of the world that needs so much to increase unemployed, to decrease unemployment? And let me just, there's another question here, just in the interest of time. Let's have that second question. Thank you. Yeah. My name is uh, Raj Bhushan. Good afternoon, Secretary General. You outlined the strategy for the corporations, for the government. Each one of the 7 billion population has a stakeholder, a role to play. So what would be your mission and message to each one of us in terms of need versus greed, excess consumption, how to make us use less resources needed so that we contribute to the climate change. Shall we? Well, I, I must say that uh, seeing from a Mediterranean point of view, one of the biggest failures in Europe in the recent past has been not to understand how vital it is to support development and especially uh, employment, young people's employment in the northern part of Africa, close to the Mediterranean. I mean, um, I mentioned Tunisia just recently, but if you look at all that area, all that area had many problems, but one of the big accelerators of those problems was the very high level of youth unemployment. And those areas have comparative advantages in, 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 in energy. And namely, if one looks at the recent developments of solar energy, I think uh, it would be very interesting for Europe to start thinking seriously of huge investments in solar energy in that part of the world and the possibility of um, uh, uh, energy uh, to be moved. China, by the way, China, um, as uh, we all heard about the Belt and Road Initiative, but China is launching another initiative on high voltage electric grids to allow for transportation of electricity at long distance without losses, which means they are already seeing that with renewable energy, there will be some areas of the world that will be particularly benefited from their point of view of comparative advantage, but probably not close to the areas of consumption. And so I think that it would be very important for Europeans and North Africans and uh, Middle Easterns together to look into a long-term strategy of uh, energy development. And that, I believe, would create a lot of opportunities to the northern part of Africa. Um, of course, it's not the only thing, because there are many other, especially more labor-intensive areas that could be envisaged. And there is also the migration dimension. I mean, there are many things, too. But this probably is one of the ones, uh, is one that, that, that should be considered. Now, what can citizens do? No. First, when you vote, think of your grandchildren. Because they can't vote. They can't vote. But your decisions are going to affect their life. No. So when you vote, think about your grandchildren. This is my first advice. Um, and I have to say that I have thought a lot about it uh, when I started to have grandchildren. Uh, because I, I was mentioning uh, when I. Uh, can you imagine? My grandfather, maternal grandfather, was born in 1875. He died in 1960. But he was my grandfather. I know him very well. I mean, I lived with him. I mean, he lived in another world. My grandchildren will live in another world. What we are deciding now will affect their lives in ways we can't forecast. But one thing we know, if we don't deal with climate change now, we are going to ruin many of their chances to have a positive life. So when you vote, Vote thinking about your grandchildren. And second, 
And second, if you don't have grandchildren, vote about your, with your neighbor's grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but I'm not talking about any election in particular, any country in particular. I'm talking about the motivation of the electorates. Uh, it's very interesting if you see, for instance, what's happening in several countries. Europe is probably the area I know better politically, even because I was a politician in the past. Um, the, the voting patterns tend to uh, more and more um, uh, take into account the interests of the present generation of elderly people and less and less the interest of the youngest generations. This is the pattern. So my advice is people should think about their grandchildren when they vote or about the, uh, And second, I mean, citizens can engage to the civil society. There is one thing that is clear for me. Governments are losing power everywhere. And that is probably why you have this authoritarian reflex in many societies, because as governments are feeling they're losing power, there is this authoritarian reflex that we see in several parts of the world. And civil societies are emerging. And that's probably why they are repressed in some parts of the world, because we see and how these new forms of communication support this emergence of civil societies to get engaged with civil society, to get engaged in, in, an, active, uh, in an activist approach on these issues is, I think, very, very important. On these and in many other issues, humanitarian issues, human rights issues, issues related. I mean, there are faith-based organizations. There are all kinds of ways in which the civil society expresses itself. I think that the more and more we engage through the civil society, uh, the more and more we contribute to make our societies more democratic. Uh, uh, I must say that uh, there is a German philosopher that is probably the, 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 the political philosopher that had more influence in my own thinking. Uh, his name is Abermas. Abermas has many contributions. I'm not going. Uh, uh, but there is one idea that, uh, uh, that strongly impressed me. Uh, uh, when he, he was saying that uh, what is typical of a modern democracy is the permanent interflow of communication between the political society and the civil society, and the way in which the civil society influences the daily decisions of the political society. And uh, I think that this is absolutely true. And so uh, it's not just to vote every four years, thinking about your grandchildren. It's in between getting engaged with the civil society as strongly as possible to, for that civil society to influence the daily decisions of your political society. Thank you, Secretary General. On behalf of NYU and Stern, we so appreciate your leadership and passion and hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great pleasure. <laughs>